Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. We turn now at the conclusion of Unit 6 in our study of the epic of the oral tradition uh, and more particularly the hero and the hero's quest. To look now in your hymnals at 1193 and following, we're going to take a look at two speeches. The first one here now, Chief Dan George's There Is a Longing, and then uh, following that one we'll take a look at Nelson Mandela's uh, Glory and Hope. Before we begin, let's, however, pay attention at level 2B on page 1193. So go there quickly with me to 2B. And the literary analysis topic, we've not really specifically spoken about this topic yet uh, in our conversations, but we've been playing the game the entire time. Philosophical assumptions. Let's, everything that's in bold, let's write down. An author's purpose, we want to write that down, or goal, is shaped by his or her philosophical assumptions or basic beliefs. Philosophical assumptions can be based on many factors, political beliefs, moral, ethical beliefs, and cultural influences. In some cases, the author may use these basic beliefs to support his or her argument. The response of the audience or readers depends on whether they share the author's basic beliefs. To read critically, identify the author's basic beliefs and assumptions in the work, decide whether you accept them or whether the audience would be likely to accept them, then evaluate whether these assumptions help the author achieve his or her purpose. You have an assumptions chart that I would recommend that you maybe consider using in our study of both these two texts. And then, of course, we will be doing some comparison and contrasting of these texts as well. Let's turn now to page 1194. Let's remind ourselves that these vocabulary words we want to study and know for our examination that's coming. Let's introduce ourselves to Chief Dan George. Note your dates, 1899 to 1981, so you can see that he lived a very long life, right? Chief Dan George, I'm just reading now with you for some biographic information. Chief Dan George had many careers, including actor and writer, Chief of a Salish band of Native Americans in British Columbia, Canada, he was deeply concerned about improving the relationships between Native Americans and other North Americans. So let's write that down. In other words, Chief Dan George's central focus is to begin to answer the question, how can Native peoples and Americans who are not Natives coexist, cohabitate, live together, get, uh, find some understanding of each other? Chief Dan George used the prominence he gained from his film and television roles to raise public awareness about the plight of Canada's Native peoples. By the 1960s, he had become an unofficial spokesman for Native Americans and the environment. Throughout all of his endeavors against injustice, he always advocated peace over violence. Uh, he was nominated for an Academy Award as Best Supporting Actor for his role in the movie Little Big Man. And the background for this speech the struggle of Native Americans. When Europeans settled in the Americas, they encountered tribal peoples who had lived on the land for thousands of years. Their initial fear and prejudice led to violence, and many Native tribes were destroyed. Nevertheless, Native American culture survived. Today, Native Americans continue to discover ways to succeed in the 21st century while maintaining their own cultural identity. There is a longing now. We will turn to page 1196, 1197 and following. There is a longing reads both as a speech as well as a poem in many ways, okay? It has a beautiful melodic lilt to it. Let's pay attention now to the text itself. We'll read along and then we'll make some observations afterwards. There is a longing. Let's read closely now. There is a longing by Chief Dan George. There is a longing in the heart of my people to reach out and grasp that which is needed for our survival. There is a longing among the young of my nation to secure for themselves and their people the skills that will provide them with a sense of worth and purpose. They will be our new warriors. Their training will be much longer and more demanding than it was in olden days. The long years of study will demand more determination. Separation from home and family will demand endurance. But they will emerge with their hand held forward not to receive welfare, but to grasp the place in society that is rightly ours. I am a chief, but my power to make war is gone. 
and the only weapon left to me is speech. It is only with tongue and speech that I can fight my people's war. 1198. Oh, great spirit, give me back the courage of the olden chiefs. Let me wrestle with my surroundings. Let me once again live in harmony with my environment. Let me humbly accept this new culture and through it rise up and go on. Like the thunderbird of old, I shall rise again out of the sea. I shall grab the instruments of the white man's success, his education, his skills. With these new tools, I shall build my race into the proudest segment of your society. I shall see our young braves and our chiefs sitting in the houses of law and government, ruling and being ruled by the knowledge and freedoms of our great land. All right, let's spend a few minutes now and annotate this text and get some sense of the power that is being suggested here through just notice a very few lines. Let's go ahead and put this at level 2B right away. You can say a lot without a lot of words. That's the power of good poetry, we, we might say. So as we take a look at this poem speech, it's hard to know which one to call it first. I like to call it a poem first. It's so beautifully constructed. Let's speak about the different kinds of ideas that are being presented working at level 1 and at 2A. Notice he begins with, there is a longing in the heart of my people. He's already identifying himself with the native peoples to reach out and grasp that which is needed for our survival. So let's pause and start there at level one. This is going to be a text about how to survive. Write that down. This is going to be a text about how to survive. What do you mean how to survive? How to make it through the experience of, first of all, having one's own culture and then having one's culture dramatically changed or altered by the introduction of a, another culture or a series of cultures, right? Survival. The question will be central to this whole poem speech. How do we survive? Look at the next thought. There's a longing, notice the repetition. Let's put this at 2B right away. The repetition, we're gonna see this several times um, where certain words are repeated. Therefore making it like a song, we might say. Something where there's ability to remember and of course, it's got a, a beautiful rhythm. There is a longing among the young of my nation, he identifies himself obviously as the old, now speaking about the young, to secure for themselves and their people the skills that will provide them with a sense of worth and purpose. Let's pause and put this at level one. He makes the observation that to survive, you have to have skills. Now in the old days, of course, those skills had primarily to do with hunting, sometimes, of course, warfare, but the skills now will be different. Notice the ultimate goal and the only way for survival to actually happen is for any peoples, especially of course these native peoples that he's speaking about, to feel a sense of worth and purpose. We want to write that down for sure. That's that notion. The only way you can ever make it in your life is to have a sense of worth and a sense of purpose. Notice here in worth, we're not talking about how much money you're valued at. No, 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 it's way more important than that. Now we are to some of those philosophical assumptions. The only people who ever understand happiness, the only people who survive are the people who understand that they are worth something and they have some purpose in their life, right? They get up every morning with some sense of purpose. What is the point of all of this? We maybe will ask you as freshmen, Freshman is ninth grade. That means you've been in school for nine years. Begging the obvious question, what have you what what has been the meaning? What's been the purpose of all of that experience, right? Let's keep going. They, that is to say the young, the, the young generation, will be our new warriors. Like the old warriors, only somehow different, fundamentally different. So let's think about this one for a moment. Obviously, it's interesting. We are in a school where our school mascot is the Warriors. So it's an interesting thing to read a line like this. What are the new Warriors? Who are the new Warriors? That is to say, an old man is saying about the young generation that's coming up, 
they will somehow fundamentally be different from the old and yet somehow fundamentally be very similar in that they're both warriors. Let's take a look at what these new warriors will be. Their training will be much longer and more demanding than it was in olden days. Whoa, whoa, whoa. First of all, a whole lot of the old timers might say, what are you talking about? It took years and years in the olden days to be able to learn how to track animals, how to live on and off of the land. The movement, the migration movements of, of wildlife, like buffalo, for example. What do you mean the new will have it harder than the old? Let's put that in our notes, though. That's exactly what he's saying. The new generation will have it harder than the old. And by the way, you don't have to be a, a, a native uh, American to appreciate what it is that he's saying as he's making this distinction between the young and the old. And here, notice, he says, it's harder to be young today than the old timers had it when they were young. Now that is an interesting idea. One more of his philosophical assumptions. It is a fairly interesting question to ask at 3B. To what degree do you think it's harder today to be a 17 year old than it was for your grandma or your grandpa? Hmm, very interesting question. How do you guys have it harder? Some would argue you have it much easier because of all the technologies, et cetera, et cetera, right? How is it harder? Take a look at what he says at line 10. I'll tell you how it's harder. This will be interesting given, of course, that we are students ourselves. The long years of study will demand more determination. Whoa, whoa, let's put that in our notes. Some of my freshmen say, oh, man. It takes a long time to get through school, or so it seems. It takes a long time to get through school. Although, of course, time is a funny thing. I mean, you're a ninth grader. You'll be a senior in four years. We'll qualify it as three. If you're a ninth grader, that means the amount of time you had from sixth grade to now is the amount of time you have left in high school. So what were you doing in sixth grade? Who were you and how long ago was that? Some of my freshmen say, dude, that just seems like a blink of an eye ago that I was in sixth grade. That's the amount of time you have left in high school. And yet it is true what he says. To be a student requires a whole lot of determination. Notice at 3A, this sounds a whole lot like what Dean Smith was saying in an earlier conversation about what it takes to be a good ball player. You've got to stick with it. It's not going to be easy, he says. Why? Because young people have a tendency to want things fast, and when it doesn't come, they want to quit. It's the nature of being young. Right? It's frustrating if we don't get what we want right away. He says, no, no, it's going to be tough. Determination. Notice another one. Separation from home and family will demand endurance. Huge. The fact that to get the education one needs, sooner or later probably one has to leave home and family and leave the place where one has known all one's life. That in and of itself could be very, very demanding. Scary even, we might say. Right? Look at the next one. But they will emerge. This is his hope. This is his goal. These young will emerge with their hand held forward, not to receive welfare, but to grasp the place in society that is rightly ours. In other words, the argument is, in the end, the only way we can know worth is to earn what we have. Right? The only way. The only way. You have to earn the things that you gain. And in the process of gaining those, through earning, through hard work, he says, you understand your worth and therefore your purpose. It's the only way. It's the only way it'll work, right? He says, now to continue, I am a chief, but my power to make war is gone. And the only weapon left to me is speech. It's an interesting concept. Let's put it in our notes. The idea that speech, language, is a weapon. Of course, in the history of the native peoples and their relationship, for example, with governments like the U.S. government, language was often used as a weapon, unfortunately, a really disturbing weapon, a violent, violent weapon, lying in the political lies that can be told. Notice here he says it, though, the only thing I have left as a weapon is language, the ability to communicate. He says it again, it's only with tongue and speech that I can fight my people's war. Notice a man of peace 
Right? He's a huge peace activist, but he uses the language of war. But he says the most important now thing we can do is to learn language. Finally, on page 1198, the speech poem turns into a request, a prayer, we might say. Notice he elicits, first of all, the Great Spirit. Oh, Great Spirit, notice your side note there, the greatest power or God maybe is understood. Give me back the courage of the olden chiefs. Let's put this one in our notes. Courage is a requirement to find worth and purpose. Courage. That ability to keep going when you would prefer to quit. Give me back the courage of the olden chiefs. Notice the repetition three times of the word lad. Let me wrestle with my surroundings. Let me once again live in harmony with my environment. Let me humbly accept this new culture and through it rise up and go on. That is to say, let's take each one in turn. Wrestling with my surroundings. In other words, it's not going to be easy. There's going to be foreign environments that I'm going to have to find a way to live within. It's not going to be easy. Look at the next one. Let me, he says, live in harmony with my environment. Let's write that word harmony down. Many of my freshmen have said that's probably the central word of this entire speech. Harmony. The notion of somehow everything balancing out. You know, like you go to a piano and you sit down and you hit it. And if you know music, you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. That piano needs to be tuned. Or a guitar and you strum it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That guitar needs to be tuned. What do you mean it needs to be tuned? Well, it's not in harmony. Our lives often can be lived, it seems, this way. Where we're not fully in harmony. It's like things are not very well, let's use this word, balanced or equilibrated. And we somehow don't feel like we're somehow right. We're a little bit off. He says, I hope I can learn to live in the different kinds of surroundings that are constantly happening. If you think about it, this is the challenge of what it means to grow older, right? As you grow older, you grow more and more accustomed to the things you like. Of course, time has a tendency of changing everything, right? So he says, I hope that I can somehow grow okay with my surroundings, harmony. Finally, and this one may be the most controversial of the things that he has to say, and his philosophic assumptions coming through here, there were lots of people who really disagreed with what he's about to say. So let's look critically at it. The last of the three lets at line 24. Let me humbly accept this new culture. And through it, rise up and go on. Whoa. Very, very controversial. Put it in your notes. Very controversial. What was he saying? He's saying, we have to accept change. We have to accept that we got to get on with the lives that we've got to live. We have to accept humbly this kind of change, this new culture. However, number two, through education, through study, through language, he says we can rise up and somehow, he says, go on. In other words, we cannot quit. We cannot give up. Of course... We understand why a poem a speech like this would be in a unit six on heroism, courage, the hero, and his or her courage, right? It takes a lot of courage to be able to, to do what he's suggesting. Then an interesting simile, and it's going to take us back to the famous word picture of the phoenix bird. You'll maybe remember the phoenix bird. That old bird makes his nest, burrows down into it, and then ignites in fire out of the ashes comes a small new bird and then new growth, right? That notion of regeneration. Let's see how he plays that game. Like the thunderbird of old, by the way, your, your footnote notice says that the thunderbird's a powerful supernatural creature that was thought to produce thunder by flapping its wings and to produce lightning by opening and closing its eyes. In the folklore of some native nations, the thunderbird is a constant warfare with the powers beneath the waters. So, here we go. Like the thunderbird of old, I shall rise again out of the sea. I shall grab the instruments of the white man's success. And what is it that is the instruments of the white man's success? Do you see the dash? Learn how to read closely. That's the power, the use of the dash, right? Now, what is it? Three things. His or two things. His education, his skills. 
That is to say, education and technology, the keys, education and technologies, the ways that we are going to go forward is going to be through education. Don't throw away your opportunity of an education, he says. It's the most important thing that you can possess. Why? Change. Change. It's coming. I was talking to a student the other day who was ready to drop out. Dude, I'm dropping out. What are you going to do? I'm going to get a job at Big Mac. I said, do you understand that within 20 years, every Big Mac in the world will have no humans working in it anymore? What are you talking about? Computers will do it all. Technology. Right? So that, for example, we can go to a Big Mac in Worland, a Big Mac in Denver, or a Big Mac in Tokyo, and the food quality will be exactly the same. Why? Because machines are making all of the food and distributing it. You won't even have to meet a human being. You'll simply walk up, hit a button, say, I want my Big Mac, and it'll be produced for you, and it'll taste exactly the same no matter what Ma Big Mac you walk into in the entire world. Uh, so what do I do for a job? That's called an education. Why? Because technologies are changing the way the world is. It is inevitable. It is coming. And if you don't have an education, you've got no ability to get the new jobs that you know are coming. It's an inevitability. That is to say, skills are linked to education here. And, let's put it in our notes, for him, that's the only way survival happens. You can't survive without education and skills. You have to have them. Many readers of this poem say, whoa, this is like a great poem for any young ninth grader. It is. To challenge ninth graders to accept the fact that you have to stay in school and get an education. Now, let's be clear. School is not the only form of education, correct? When you are working at a Big Mac, for example, that is, some would argue, as much or more of an education, learning how to deal with people, learning how to take care of yourself, etc.